Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome everybody. This is week seven of our GitOps on AWS webinar series. And today we're focusing on machine learning models on AWS EKS. Following today, we will be sharing our registration links for our complimentary hands-on workshop um, this Thursday. Um, the workshop is free and sponsored by our partners AWS, so stay on until the end and we will send out the link for you to register. And then Paul, if you flip over, please. A few housekeeping items, please. Um, this call is being recorded and everybody is in listen-only mode. If you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A panel and we will address those at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So our speaker today is Paul Curtis. He's Principal Solutions Architect here at Refrex. We have a quick bio on him as well as Twitter handle and email address. And then I would love to hand it over to you, Paul. Okay, good morning and good afternoon. It's nice we have a small crowd today. So if you have a question, um, definitely hit the Q&A or raise your hand. And since there's a small number, we might just unmute for questions today, just to keep it simple. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things. Uh, so let's bring up our agenda. I wanna talk about Weaveworks a little bit, but mostly I wanna talk about how to do operational machine learning. It's less about the actual model that we're going to use and the workshops, more about deployment and how you manage. Uh, so the term MLOps, which was actually um, came about about a year ago, we're talking about how you operationalize machine learning. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Some very specific things that you can do with EKS uh, as far as app profiles, as well as standard profiling to be able to build out uh, platforms really quickly. Um, benefits here is, is that EKS gives you a lot of flexibility and it means that you can spin up the machine learning training, for example, uh, separate. So we'll, let's move on. So. Uh, Weaveworks is a company. We're an open source based company. For those who have heard of us, uh, we have a number of different tools that our engineers have contributed to the community. Flux, Flagger, WeaveNet, um, WeaveScope. Uh, we're contributors to Kubernetes itself. So um, to the underlying project, as well as a number of other tools that spread out across various different parts of the ecosystem for Kubernetes. We as a company um, promote GitOps, the methodology to use Git and automated tooling to do deployments in Kubernetes. Um, we have services so that you can hire us. We do a lot of training. That's one of the big things that we're doing right now. Uh, we also have uh, CREs that will work with customers for short-term or long-term duration. Last thing is, is that we take all of the tools that you've heard us build and you know that we do, and we package them into a platform providing support, curated sources, bug fixes, CVs, all that kind of stuff um, as a package, including 24 seven uh, call Weaveworks support. So that's what we do as a company. The next slide I'm gonna use is very simple description of GitOps, but I'm gonna focus this on machine learning because in the standard development cycle you have a ci process so you have continuous integration and that's usually tools you know like there's ides there's testing tools and there's typically jenkins or one of the other uh, ci tools involved right but in the ml world it's a little bit different and we're going to talk about specifics but the same basic operational model applies to machine learning as it does to standard software releases. And we'll talk about that in a second, but keep this in mind is, is that when I you see this continuous integration, think about the things that you have to do to prepare a model for actual usage. And then the operational side of it is how do you deploy the models? So GitOps is a methodology actually doesn't just do Kubernetes deployment. You can use it for a lot of other things because the same principles apply, right? The basic premise is that you're using Git as a single source of truth. You have automated tools that deploy for you. Uh, 
And whether that's a straight deployment or progressive delivery, data movement uh, triggers back to uh, model rebuilds and retraining, things like that. And the other key is, is that everything's observable. So for those who build machine learning models or, or artificial intelligence models in, let's say, the finance world. Uh, one of the regulations is that if you're using a model to determine risk, right, you know, I'm gonna buy a stock, what's the risk? You have to be able to reliably recreate and prove how you came to that decision. One of the ways to do that is to lock the model in get and version it. So having the ability to do versioning like that in the machine learning world becomes very, very uh, important when you're dealing with things like compliance. Other models, um, drug models this is another good example where you're running hundreds of trials and you're doing different models on, different, on the same data set and you wanna keep track of each of the models as you trialed them. Okay, so the data set may stay the same, but I may try different algorithms, different parameter sets, all kinds of things on a model, and I wanna have those versioned so that when I find the best one, I can go back to it, and then I can show how I did it. In both cases, risk and in uh, pharmaceutical testing, you have to have repeatability. You have to be able to do it again and again. So GitOps actually plays very nicely here. Now, obviously, you don't, put the whole data set in Git. You may put the sample set in there, but certainly the algorithms, the parameter sets. And when we talk about uh, machine learning pipelines like Kubeflow, all of the pipeline information needed to recreate how the models were built and deployed. So those are the things that we're gonna talk about doing. Um, so let's move on. So basic machine learning, um, I'm looking at the list of names. I'm guessing probably some of you might be exposed to data science. Some of you might be data scientists. But for the most part, the people operating Kubernetes clusters, deploying them, configuring them, things like that, typically aren't data scientists. So data scientists are not software engineers. So they like a tool set. Um, there's some very common ones. You'll see Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Pandas, Panda, the whole set of tools that come in Python. There's like mountains of stuff there. Okay, I use GeoPandas for a couple of projects. All right, then there's a whole other group of people who work around the TensorFlow environment. So there's many different kinds of machine learning and AI that you can do with TensorFlow as a tool set. And there are others. But for the most part, a data scientist is taking data trying things out and looking at results and iterating this process over and over and over again. So they're definitely not writing code or writing as little as possible. Now, when they create something, a model that they wanna use, let's say it's a recommendation engine, right? The recommendations that that model gives today are great for today, but they probably won't be very useful a month from now when some new hot product comes on and you wanna make those recommendations. So a model is not a static thing. A model is a living thing. It actually changes and you retrain it and you re-educate it on a regular basis. So here again, this is where GitOps and retraining makes this very simple because I can reproduce these models and reproduce these training exercises very, very simply simply because I have all the information I need to do it, okay? And the last thing is, is that when you go to deploy an actual model, all right, you typically test it. Now, you can run a data set against a model, a static data set, to make sure that the model doesn't do something really stupid, like make a prediction, you know, make a, somebody bought an Apple and make a recommendation for a Buick or something, you know, very odd. But typically, when you roll out a new model, you don't just turn the switch. You go over a period of time. So you test it under greater and greater load and more varied samples. And this is where progressive delivery comes in. And actually, in the GitOps methodology, is very, very easy to implement. So the Weave tool Flagger 
is a very good example of how to do progressive delivery of the serving model over time. Okay, so let's uh, step on one last couple of things. So what does this look like? I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but these are the basic steps, right? The first thing is you got some data, you got a sample data. Uh, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll work with a couple of easy ones, but think of um, population data. Right, there's a bunch of information about the population. It may come from various different sources. So you have to collect the data. Usually it comes in various different forms. You also may combine the data. Okay, so you may say I've got the census data plus I've got the population data plus I've got demographics plus I've got, you know, incomes. You know, there's a lot of things that you may want to use as part of your model. So this is a data scientist does this and says, I think there's a correlation between name of their street and how much they spend on apples. Okay, I'm making things up. So the next thing is he goes through the data and he looks to see what's there. And these are um, vectors, values typically. So these are features of the model. Okay, what things am I gonna look for? What do I want the model to try and figure out? So I wanna, I would, for demographics, you'd use age is a good example, zip code, okay? Um, might be gender, sometimes not, okay? But also where that person lives, what's the socioeconomic range? So there's a lot of features that you need your model to have because what you're doing is you're saying, I want you to predict Apple sales, sales of apples. And here's some of the features I think that are gonna make a difference based on how many apples these people buy or where they buy them from. And I'm gonna slow down and explain that again. The goal is to find, I wanna sell more apples. So what I wanna do is I wanna find the people most likely to buy apples and tell them, hey, we're selling apples. Pretty straightforward. But what I don't know is what features of that sample, that group of people are going to give me the best prediction. And those are the features. So the data analysis is we're gonna go through this over and over and over again and try and figure it out. Once you do that, you actually have to get the data. Now, you may start with a data set and add to it. A lot of times you may have several data sets. Okay, but this is again, this is a data science. This is what a data scientist is doing. Most of the data they're using is freely available. Um, in some industries, you will purchase data from companies like Equinix, um, financial data, credit card data, things like that. Mobile phone information, how, ma you know, how, many, people are, how many people are using their phone in New York City, things like that. Travel data. Okay, toll data, actually the toll booths. I don't know, in, in New York, everything's got a toll on it. So every time you cross the George Washington Bridge, they know who you are. So you can get an anonymized version of that data. So you can look at travel patterns, okay, things like that. But you have to get all the data, you have to clean it up and you have to put it in a format or a form that actually works relatively well. And you only want the features that you wanna try out. So to go back to our Apple example, we'll say, okay, there's zip code, there's census block, let's say is a good one, uh, median age, median income, okay, something like that. And that's the features you start with. Then you build your data set and then you go to the next step. Now this is where the science of data science gets to be more of data art. I can pick in a model, I can pick an algorithm, I can pick a formula and have it run through all of this data to see if there's a correlation and how well correlated, let's say one of the features I have in my data set is to the outcome. So we said, we're, well, let's, let's use age, median age. All right, we know, we want to find out, is there any correlation between the median age and the amount of apples they buy, right? 
That's one of the things we're testing. So we will tie different algorithms, we will try different models, and we will try to uh, emphasize or de-emphasize certain parameters and features. And we will do this, the sci data scientists, over and over and over and over again until they find one that correlates really well. Once they have that, that becomes how you train the model going forward. Then you give it more data and you make sure that your assumptions are right. Okay? At some point, when you think you got it right, okay, where well, your test data looks pretty good, correlation's pretty good, the percentages are very high, you have to make a decision at that point. And the decision is, okay, let's test this model. And how do you test a model? Well, typically, you're doing the training on a small data set. Now, where I came from, I came out of the big data world. A small data set might be a couple terabytes. When I go to evaluate a model, I'm going to evaluate it against as much data as I have. So if we took the travel patterns one, you know, that's 30, 40 terabytes worth of data. Now, everybody gets a little shocked at that. Right. Remember, the data sets don't move. You typically upload them, and they're usually in S3. And that data set, you may have to clean it up and make it usable. But once you've done that, you're probably not going to do much else with it other than just store it. But when you get into moving in the Kubernetes world things around, you have to make sure that that data is accessible. All right. So in a model evaluation, they'll run it, and then they'll check the correlation of an actual data set against what their test data set was, and they, they better be close. If they aren't, they're going to go way back to the data prep and model training, and they're going to do this iteration over and over again. So I'm drawing this big circle with my hand. This is the CI part of data science, right? Because what they're trying to do is get a model and its parameters, uh, the algorithm it's going to use, and how um, important those parameters are. So weighted, they weight them. So those features uh, on their test data set, and then they want to run it against a real data set, and they want those to come out pretty close to being the same. Right? Because then you know that no matter what I feed it, what data I run in the model, I should get accurate predictions. All right. Now, once I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, you know, I've tested it, I've tested it, it seems to match, I've tweaked everything I'm going to tweak, I'm ready to do a deployment. Now, this is a whole different world because all of a sudden this changes from the data scientist who basically is playing with this stuff on his own, right? You know, on their own workstation, they're using Python and Jupyter Notebooks and, and that kind of stuff. They're just doing it. Okay, and they might have a small test data set on their laptop, maybe a few hundred gigabytes in size that they can actually play with their models. Now they actually want to go ahead and test it. So they do the evaluation. Now it's time to deploy it. Okay, so what makes up a model serving? So the model serving comes down to taking some input data that's provided and evaluating it against the model to produce an output. So if we go back to our Apple recommendation, okay, we now have a model that says if I, if I can tell, my, if I can ask the model, does this person, is this person got a high prob probability of buying apples? Well, based on the features that we gave the first model, if I give a single sample of that same data, the model should tell me what the uh, probability is that this guy will buy an apple, all right? Now, think of Amazon is probably the most common and most widely referenced recommendation model. You go to Amazon, you search for a uh, USB cable or something, TV set, and you see, you know, you put in, you know, six foot USB cable, right? If you scroll down, you'll see, first off, they give you a list of what products are available. And you scroll down, you'll see a bunch of recommendations. That is a served model. 
what that says is based on the fact that you're an Amazon user, obviously, we know some things about you, and all the other hundreds of thousands of Amazon users who have bought something over the last day, or two days, or five days, I can say, well, of the 100,000 Amazon users who bought a six-foot USB cable, 80% of them bought this too, right? So I'm now serving, given a sample, six-foot USB cable and Paul, people like Paul who bought six-foot USB cables also bought this. The goal is they're trying to sell you more, right? So our Apple example is the same thing. I think that this person will have a high probability of buying apples. This is where Kubernetes works really well because a model serving, okay, which is actually the last step here, um, has to be a scalable system, right? So if you're running a web service like Amazon, think about how many requests for recommendations it gets in a given second, right? Even if you're doing something even smaller on an e-commerce site, okay, where somebody's buying a computer monitor, right? And most people buy computer monitors, we recommend that you buy the cleaning cloth, okay? So these are the kinds of things that become the predictions, right? Kubernetes is perfect for this because you can scale it. So both as a pod and the cluster itself, it does all the network routing, right? So I can have 10 of these model serving containers, pods running, right? And Kubernetes is gonna take care of who gets what. It's a stateless thing, so it works really well. Okay, so it makes it very, very simple. All right, so Kubernetes as a serving platform becomes very important. Okay, so how do we roll this into the last step? And I add this one in here because this is one of the few things that is outside the scope, not outside the scope, that's not the right word, um, where GitOps is not necessarily going to help you. Right? Everything else on this list, GitOps is very helpful. Git and the methodology behind it and GitOps and the methodology of delivering it and deploying it is very helpful. Monitoring is something that in the data science world, when they talk about it, it's not like Prometheus. Okay, What they're looking for is they're talking about a feedback loop. And I'm going to diagram that in a second. Okay, so I'm going to stop for a second and look for raised hands. Um, in the participants, any questions? Um, Please use the chat or the Q&A and then we can address that. Yeah, I, yeah, because it seems that for whatever reason, I can't see the Q&A today. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to just move on. So let's talk about machine learning operations, All right? And there really is three parts of this, okay? When we talked about continuous integration in that original diagram, we had a circle. When you're developing software, that's, you know, write, build, test, write, build, test, write, build, test. So it's a CI pipeline, the developer pipeline. In the ML ops world, this is the uh, data, tweak the model, test and evaluate, tweak the model, test and evaluate. And you do this iteration where you change the parameters, you change the weights, you change the features you're actually looking at in the model. You might even change the algorithm of the whole model itself until such time as it's giving you good correlation. Right? So you're trying to find, our goal is, how do we predict who's gonna buy an apple? And I may do this 50 or 100 times until I get that set that says, I can now reliably predict if a person fits this demographic in these weights or age, location, whatever, whatever features, whatever information you're giving it, I can now predict whether they'll buy an apple or not. Now, that's at a small scale. That's usually done on a data scientist's workstation or laptop, and the data set that they're testing against is usually pretty small. 
So in a recommendation model, it might be a couple hundred thousand buyers. Okay. Right. I mean, you know, the new laptops, you can fit a lot of data, right? But it's also the amount of time it takes to run. And the second part of it is, is that now we're going to use GitOps to actually deploy this out. Right? And that becomes very straightforward because in the demonstration and the tool set that we're going to talk about, which is Kubeflow, is all declarative, which means GitOps makes it very simple. And the pipelines that Kubeflow uses both in the integration part, the training part, as well as the predictive and delivery part, um, actually can be declared and you can do this with controllers. There's a lot of ways to do it and it makes it very simple. We pick on Kubeflow um, today versus other tools that will provide you with this because it is declarative and it's easy to modify. It's also open source and there is a lot of tooling that surrounds it that data scientists already use. So as a, as a machine learning operations, um, it actually fills a big gap, right? Because the data scientists will do their own thing and they use, let's say, Jupyter Notebooks, just to pick one, okay? Kubeflow will handle that, not only at the model training, but also on the model delivery, all right? The last step in here is talking about continuous training. So when I said that monitoring loop, this is what I'm talking about. So if you have 100,000 or 100 million samples to work with, how do you go back and retrain your model? Well, you want to collect the data and you want to collect the results that the predictive model did. So every time it makes a recommendation, I want to know what recommendation it made and I want to know what the input data looked like. So typically this is saved and then this data set now becomes part of what trains the model. So continuous training, depending on the model and the algorithm you're using, can happen interactively, meaning for every sample it tweaks the model, or it can happen in batch. Um, recommendation engine like Amazon's is done once a day, right? So they'll gather up all the days, sales, and that they'll feed that into the training. Okay, rerun the model, which may tweak the parameters slightly for tomorrow and give you a different recommendation score. Okay, so what does this look like in practical terms? So the pink box, okay, just in general is the CI part. So this is the machine learning part. So you can see it basically, I'm not going to go through this again because we've already talked about this, but basically what you can see is here's the steps that make up that pipeline. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is, is that in the yellow box in the middle is this iterative process, okay? Sometimes you do go back at the beginning and re-extract data or you add a data set because you're not getting anything that's correlating. Right, it's like, you know, okay, the features I picked, they're not really working out so much. So you go backwards. You'll say, okay, let's add some more data to this and maybe we can find better features to give me better correlations, to give me better scoring for my models. The other thing that's in here, and I'm going to emphasize this a lot because of my background, is the raw data. Now Kubernetes doesn't do persistent data. They leave that to you, it gives you access to the persistent data, but actually doesn't manage the data itself. So be aware that when you get into the machine learning world, we're not talking about you know, a 10 gigabyte database. We're, we're talking about five, 600 terabytes of raw data that is generated off of, I guess I'm allowed to say it now. Um, we did Pandora's recommendation engine, and that was 500 terabytes a day. So just give you a general idea of how big these data sets get, right? That's not something you're going to put in Git. It's something you're going to manage differently. But these models and Kubeflow and the Kubernetes cluster that runs this has to have access to that data. 
So whether it's S3 or it's using uh, EBS or some other storage mechanism, might actually be in a data warehouse as well. So be aware that that's very much a part of this. So just deploying the containers doesn't solve all the problem. You have to get the data. At the very end of this process, there's this thing in this box called the model registry. And typically a model registry, uh, depending on which toolkit you're using, uh, might actually be a thing. It might be an application, a piece of software. However, in the GitOps methodology, since everything that I used to train the model in the pink box was done declaratively using Kubeflow and GitOps, it means that the model registry is nothing more than a version of that, i.e. it is a git commit ID. It can be that simple, right? So what you want to be able to say is how do I reproduce this trained model? Well, if I have all of the declarations for the pipeline and all of the containers and parameters for that yellow box that produce the trained model, it means that I can reproduce that model at will. From a compliance point of view, for risk, for example, or as we were talking about at the beginning, drug sampling, uh, drug testing, it's a compliance thing as well. Because then I can roll back and say, this data set, okay, on this date, with this model, produced these results. So I have complete auditability. Um, in the US, that is an absolute requirement for automated trading on risk actually have to have it. Most insurance companies want to prove how it was underwritten, what model was used to produce the underwriting, or what the payout was. In drug testing, they want to be able to reproduce the model that said this set of population, or whatever they're testing, has been affected positively by the use of this drug. And they want to be able to prove that because that's part of the testing regime to get a new drug to market. All right. So this model registry, let's assume it's the models at defined in Git rather than the actual model. Okay. Now you get to the operational side of this, which says, all right, I'm going to serve the model. This is a whole different set of containers. Model serving can be everything from a database. I've seen it done that way. Um, to uh, more common I see web services. So they're usually an API because somebody wants to make a recommendation. And so they provide data into it and something in this model serving code takes the sample, puts it in the model, gives you a prediction that says, yes, he's going to buy 98% chance of him buying an Apple or in the case of Pandora, he, he, he's listening to this record, this song, and people who've listened to that song also like these songs, so it may come back with four or five recommendations. The Amazon model is like that as well. But they're typically web services. And then somewhere down in the very low end corner is the actual end user of that predictive service. So that's a lot of ground we just talked about. We basically just outlined the whole universe. Okay, so now we get to what this looks like when you actually deploy it. We drew a line in the middle here, and it, I hope you can see it, but if you see there's this dotted line between the two different parts of this. And if you go back to our original GitOps picture where we have the two circles, is basically what we say development and testing in the ML world is typically the software uh, CI process. And then staging and production is usually deployment. All right. Okay. So you now are going to deploy your application. So in a couple of things that I want to bring up here, that I want you to see how complex this can get. Uh, we talked to, we talked about the model registry, right? So model registry has got to be common to everything. Every one of these services is going to have a model registry. You're also going to have data, okay? So somewhere in this picture, there is going to be a massive amount of data stored. Both of these uh, parts, development and testing and training of models, and the other part, okay, the production and serving, have to have access to that data. 
Typically production and serving does not usually need it, right? Because they've built the model and then it's testing individual uh, requests, right? So the production side of this is actually data-wise very small or typically very small, okay? Whereas the training and testing might be hundreds of terabytes in size for data sets, all right? So the typical line, when you look at the top half in the orchestrated experiments, this is where things, tools like Kubeflow come into play, right? Because you basically define this pipeline as outlined in the yellow, in the top half of this picture, as a set of containers or a set of processes that run in sequence and the data output from step one is fed to the input of step two, the data output of step two is fed to the input of step three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A typical training like this will also have data preparation validation are usually five, six, seven steps long, right? And so this gets run continuously. It gets run when the data scientist wants to test a new model or algorithm or feature. Okay, or it gets run every night if you're building a recommendation database, for example. So they don't run it necessarily all the time. Don't we? Yeah, I don't know, Sonia. I can't get to the Q and A, but I see a little thing that can, says there is a question. I can read it to you. So the question is, what's the take on sharing GPU? Is it effective, or is there any learnings you can share? I will talk about that in a second. And yes, there's some learnings about doing that, um, why you would and would not want to do that. But it's very, very specific. All right, this is a big ugly model and I really don't like this, but understand a couple of things also in our world. The very right hand side, okay, where it has trained model, model serving production service. There's typically um, two feedback loops. Now you'll see one of them goes across from performance monitoring. And typically what is happening there is that's a model retrain. And the performance they're measuring is not the performance that you think of. The performance they're measuring is how well the prediction is working. So if you use Prometheus to do this, and, and a lot of people do, you have to have specific metrics in your production service that says, you know, it's a score. It's like, okay, I put in this input data, it got a recommendation, and I'm 98% confident of that recommendation. Well, that's a good one, right? But over time, that's going to begin to degrade. So it'll go from 98 to 95 to 92 to 80. And at some point, you're going to say, wait a minute, oh, okay. So the model's now not accurately helping us. So I need to trigger it and have it go back and rebuild it. And so the bottom pipeline is very similar to the top one, okay, but it includes val validation and evaluation, okay. That models, when it's finished, that cycle, typically then gets rolled into production. And so the trained model and the, the model serving is done with progressive delivery. Because you, you never turn the Frankenstein switch on a model. You test it. The other thing is, is that in testing it is also a performance trigger, right? The model looks good in test data, but I put it into production and all of a sudden its recommendation hit rate is you know, 60, I'm not gonna use it. I'm gonna roll back to the old one. And I wanna do that in an automated fashion and I want somebody else to monitor that. That is exactly where Flagger comes into play. That is the progressive delivery tool. The other line I want you to see is that trigger also may go back to the CI process. Okay, depending on what you want your data scientist to do, if the scoring accuracy, let's say, on your predictions goes down, you are going to want the data scientist to look at that and say, okay, maybe we need to alter the weights and the features we're using going in, or we need to tweak the model slightly. In which case, they're going to go with the top pattern, which is going to be the CI pattern that's going to go around and around and around. 
Okay. So I've seen both. Um, the more common one is the production retraining rather than going back to the data scientist, but I've seen both. So it's kind of, kind of critical. Um, oh, hang on. Let me, let me find my mouse. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to do this in EKS. All right. So there's a workshop on Thursday where we're actually going to do this, but I'm going to give you just a quick overview because we're getting low on time and then we'll answer questions. The question about CPUs um, is actually going to come into play right now. So EKS has a couple of nice things and using this with GitOps and EKS control means that you can apply profiles, uh, mo uh, you know, profile for the cluster up front. And one of the benefits of that is it means that I can spin up the machine learning pipelines basically from one command, right? Because what happens with EKS control and enabling GitOps is the GitOps methodology, the agent goes out and begins to install all the machine learning tools. And once the machine learning tools are installed, it can also declare out, for example, for Kubeflow, what the data pipeline looks like. So you might have a, as we saw in the last picture, you may have a experimental training pipeline. You may have a production retraining pipeline. You may have a model that is production serving. Okay, all of which can be run using EKS control from a standard configuration file. Now, this particular config that you're seeing in front of you is basically the infrastructure. Okay. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. When we talk about GPUs, GPUs typically are not needed in production, typically, because it's a rare thing that, it, that you're having your production prediction require that much mathematical horsepower to come up with a score, because it's typically a lookup. Now, there are some models where it does do calculation at the time of prediction, in which case, yes, GPUs are very useful, okay? Kubernetes, very nicely, and EKS, also very nicely, allows you to designate uh, the availability of GPUs and tell the scheduler to put certain containers on worker nodes with GPUs. Okay, so that's built into Kubernetes. And it's done via selectors. It's pretty straightforward how it works. For the most part, in production prediction, when you're actually serving the model, you're going to need to monitor GPU usage. Okay, however, and that may, so the question of whether you can share it or not, the answer is probably yes, but you need to monitor it to make sure it doesn't get overloaded. However, in the training, okay, where you're actually building out the model, I don't recommend doing that. I recommend locking the container to a GPU, let it have all of the GPU. Now, the good thing is, is that most of these things will run multiple containers. So we're going to talk about this from a practical standpoint in a second. But suffice it to say, this is one of the reasons that EKS makes this very easy, okay? So in EKS control, when you do things like enable the repo, this enables GitOps, okay? The agents that run uh, in the cluster called Flux basically is what is going out and going to get, getting the configuration and, and deploying all of the pieces that you need to build your data pipeline. Those could be things like TensorFlow, uh, you know, it could be containers with the Panda libraries, it might be Jupyter, could be a lot of things, okay? And Kubeflow is definitely one of those things, all right? Then you go ahead and you say, well, we're gonna use an application level profile, and this takes it a step farther. So the initial profile really doesn't do a whole lot, all right, the base level one, but, the application profile is probably going to do a lot more. In the production prediction, the production run, you're going to want to put in things like cluster auto scaling and pod auto scalers, right? Because you want to be able to scale down. 
And you, uh oh. Okay, can everybody hear me? My Mac just blinked. Yes, you're fine again. Okay, sorry about that. So in the, um, in a production workflow, what you're looking at is you want to be able to scale pods up and down and you probably want to scale um, the cluster itself up and down. So this gets into node group auto scaling in EKS for the actual worker nodes and HPA, okay, horizontal pod auto scaling for the pods themselves. Now, that's the production part of it. The training part of it is a lot different. If you use GitOps, one of the things about training a model is it typically takes a data scientists a fair amount of time to build the steps needed to train their models. Some can be very simple, and, but typically they're not. So there's, and there's usually a lot of steps. The good part is the data scientists can usually tell you what the steps are. Hi, I downloaded this data set. I ran this Python script, which cleaned up all the quotes and got rid of those stupid characters over there. Then I got this other data set and I did that. Then I used Python to put that data set, make it into one big data set. Then I took that data set and I fed it into um, whatever. I built a data frame out of it and then I began to do mathematics on it, right? So let's say there's, probably 10 Python steps there. Each of them is probably a five line Python program that did exactly what the data scientist wanted, but that was all. So think of those as microservices. So yeah, the first one, it cleaned up the data. The second one pulled the columns. Third one merged it with another file. The fourth one fed it into data frame and then pandas picked it up. And then here's the panda script that actually run the Python code that runs pandas against that. And then maybe at the end, there might be something say, oh, we're going to draw a pretty graph or graphs, a visualize of that Panda result set. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps. Those are all declared in GitOps and those are all declared with Kubeflow. Those are going to be very CPU and GPU intensive. GitOps allows you to spin up the whole cluster at once. It's like, oh, you need to train a 500 terabyte data set. And if I give you 40, you know, 40 worker nodes, that'll take an hour. If I give you five worker nodes, that'll take 24 hours, right? So you can easily configure using the EKS control config file and an app profile and a GitOps profile to be able to spin this up. And then when it's done, you just turn it off, all right? Or you scale it back down. Most customers I've seen leave it running, but they scale uh, using uh, node, node groups up and down, depending on what they're trying to train. So you can actually build burstable size training clusters this way. And this is a very common pattern, right? In production, you're typically going to know what your production numbers are going to look like, you know, how much traffic, how many predictions per second, things like that. And you may only need pod auto scaling for those burst times and potentially cluster auto scaling as well. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about Kubeflow and I'm going to be very brief. The nice thing about Kubeflow, and we're going to talk through this. This can all be in a single Git repo and can be done very, very simply. In fact, Kubeflow as the project has a way to install into EKS directly, right? It's very, very simple to do. And it makes it very simple. What you end up with is this nice UI that allows you to basically do interactive deployment. Now, that means that you can actually build out whole pipelines this way, okay? So this is what the data scientist is gonna to use to do things. The good part about Kubeflow is, is that once you've built out your pipeline, you can save it and it becomes a declarative thing. So I can reproduce the pipeline once the data scientist gets it the way he needs it to be. I can deploy it over and over and over again. 
And so his picture will look something like this. This is a very simple one, but there may be 20 or 30 steps here, right? This gets exported, this gets put into Git, and now you now have built out the whole machine learning pipeline from beginning to end. Thank you so much, Paul, really appreciate it. And then I will send out a recap to all of you um, with the workshop URL to sign up for. And then we'll hope to see you either this Thursday or potentially next week for another topic. Thank you so much. Have a good have one. Have a good day. Bye-bye.